Watch this now. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Do you see what he is saying to us? Do you hear what the, the heart of Paul is saying? Here, here's Paul. Let's just describe it this way. Here's Paul teaching Timothy. Look, Timothy, you've got to be strong and courageous. And then you've got to go find a bunch of people who will take what I'm telling you as a message and go share it with a whole bunch of people. So how many generations are we looking at here in faith? How many generations, church? Paul's the first generation. Got the word from the Lord. He goes to Timothy and makes a disciple out of Timothy. Teaches him. It's a one-to-one. -one. And he says, Timothy, now I want you to go out there in those cities where I've sent you. I want you to find capable men and women and call them to service. Mentor, train them, disciple them in the ways of Jesus so that they would then go and do the same with others. Do you think he intends that it go further? Absolutely. The reason you and I are in, the, in this building today as a body of Christ is because somebody told somebody and it went all the way down through 2,000 years of history and you and I received the good news because of it. You see, God's in this generation business. And you see, one of the first things you can know if our churches are healthy, watch this now, is not so much the size of your offering and not so much the size of your building. One of the best ways you can tell if your church is healthy is if you're reaching the second, the third, and the fourth generation with the gospel. If the gospel stops with me, but if I can teach someone else and mentor someone else in the gospel, maybe two or three, and they can mentor someone else. You see that when I teach someone to mentor them, when I teach them the ways of God, it's vital that I also teach them how to reach someone else. If I'm only giving them religion for them, it becomes a self-centered experience. And it ends with me, the consumer, the shopper of faith. It's all about mine. Is that the gospel, friends? Obviously, I'm challenging us to think radically different about why we are the body of Christ call to reach another. You see, Paul had this passion. Today we use the term discipleship. Well, what is discipleship? I mean, what does that mean? You read the word somewhere in a, in a book, you never read the word in the Bible. It's not there. But we, we think we understand what it means. The past couple of weeks, I've been stirred by this more and more. It's been a passion I might add for, for 20 years. This concept of discipleship made more popular in the past 10 years, I may say, within the Adventist church. Maybe you'd like to write some thoughts down here. I want to give you some bullet point definitions of discipleship. Okay? I want to see if I can run down through real quick. Discipleship. These are just one-liners, okay? Is passing the teachings of Jesus to somebody else. Okay, we know. We, we get that. Let's, let's dig a little deeper. Discipleship is learning the ways of God. Is that true? You with me today? All right. Discipleship is looking for others who might be open to Jesus' teaching. Okay, good. Discipleship is discovering God-given giftedness. That's discovering spiritual gifts, right? All right? How about this one? Discipleship is learning to love people very different from me. Ooh, we're getting close to home. Discipleship is a journey, not a destination. What about this one, folks? This is going to touch us a little, a little closer. Discipleship does not require technology. Discipleship does not require a budget. Discipleship does not require a building. Can you make disciples without those things? Yes, you can. You can make disciples without a budget. You can make disciples without a liturgy. What you need is the Bible 
and a person willing to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. And you're making disciples. Amen. Friends, I'm, I'm appealing to us that we begin to think about where we put our energy, where we put our focus, where we put our resources. Is it wrong to have a building? Of course not. We use these buildings to facilitate the same Maybe the bigger the better, but as long as it's facilitating discipleship. Discipleship is freely given because we freely received. Isn't that what the Lord taught us? He sent them out. And he said, freely you have received, freely give. <clears throat> Abraham, way back in the day of Abraham, the Lord said to him, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. Now watch this carefully. He's talking to his only follower, loyal follower. Well, we might say that Lot was in the group too. But he's called Abraham and he said, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. Now how far was that blessing supposed to go? Just his family? In fact, we read the promise that said that he would be a blessing to all the nations of the world. Amen. Brother, sister, the blessings of Jesus are not to end with you and me. Amen. The blessings of, of Jesus are to be through us to someone else. Amen. To use our resource. We're to be a stream, a spring that flows, a living. You ever walk up to a pool of water? And it's not getting warm from anywhere, and it gets what color? Green or, or stagnant because it's not flowing. On the other hand, if, a, if it's a spring coming out of the ground, it's probably running cool and clean, and you could probably feel comfortable drink. I would drink it. I don't know about you, but I would probably do that if I was thirsty enough. One of the challenges we have as a, as a people. And it's not pointing the finger anywhere but at ourselves, definitely me. Is that many times our systems, our structures, are not set up so much for disciple making, but rather for programs and organization. And doing big things about God, but not discipling people in God. My wife has an interesting hobby. Maybe some of you have know this hobby or have it. She likes to grow trees. She's got full grown trees right here. Let me show you a tree. She's got a couple of them. There's actually five trees in there. You believe me? There are. Let me show you this. There are five trees all growing inside this one little pot. You know what they're called? They're called bonsai trees. Start was begun in Japan. And the idea is to keep the tree as small as you can. Keep it from, have you ever seen, oh, you've seen these before? Yeah. Yes. Would anyone like to guess how old these trees are? Foot and a half tall? Not quite an inch in diameter? Ten years, I think? Do you know a tree that that, if it's not in a pot like that, if it's ten years old, it'll probably be about 18 feet? These trees are 20 plus years old. Wow. You see what she does? She cuts the tab root, she trims the branches, and she keeps them small on purpose. And one of the things you do is you keep it in a small container. It can't grow out. What do you think the roots look like underneath of that? Now, are, 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 are trees made to be small? Hmm. Do you know that you can grow bonsai trees and they can actually bear little pieces of fruit that are only about that big? It's still fruit, but it is really small. <laughs> We're not made to be contained in little boxes. God would want us to be fruitful and to multiply. And that this tree would produce seed that would blow and start new trees. I would challenge all of us to think, are we limiting God somehow by the way we do what we do? We actually, my wife actually <laughs> starves these trees. They don't get much food. They don't get much water. They, they get regular water. 
but they're intentionally almost starved to keep them small. Now, in spiritual things, who do you think wants that to happen? Exactly. Exactly. God would have us find ways to free up people to use their giftedness and resources, to use them for God's purposes, not contained by structures, but that the church together would find each person's giftedness and find out what that might be and how they might use it for God's glory. One of the best ways I know to make disciples is groups where spiritual activity is happening, fellowship in Bible study groups, in homes. I believe it's the best laboratory for training and mentoring and discipling someone else in the ways of Jesus. I'll just drop that for you to think and pray about. The main thing we must engage in is mission for others, Praying for their salvation, praying for their protection, praying for ourselves to know how God has called us. I like what Corey Tenboom wrote some time ago. She, a champion of prayer, listen to this, please. We never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect that He will get us involved in His plan for the answer. He's going to engage us somehow in what He's doing. Maybe I need to change. In fact, I think I do. I think God needs to do a hard work on my heart. And the reason I know that is because yesterday, yesterday I was driving to Apopka, and there was a car that was doing this stop and starting kind of thing, and there was another car right behind it. And it was like doing this thing going on, and this lady starts beeping in the car behind, and it's waving her arm out the window, you know? Waving her arm out the window, you get the picture? Okay, she's waving her arm out the window. And I'm in the second lane beside all this, going back and forth, and there was some road rage happening. I mean, some serious road rage. And the lady got so angry that while driving, she climbed out of the pet driver's side window, driving, and starts screaming obscenities at the driver in front of her. I mean, I was like, what is this? <laughs> now, I felt like getting into that. <laughs> In fact, I, I said to myself, I, mean, I almost said it. I noticed that the car had a license plate from a state that's not known for its courteous nature. <laughs> okay? So welling up inside of me was, why don't you sit down and shut up or go to a theme park or go home? That's what I was thinking. But I didn't say it. <laughs> I know that I need God to do work in this. <laughs> Any sinners in the <laughs> Here's what I know, folks. Here's what I know. The disciples were never perfect. Mm -hmm. Just as you and I are not perfect. But I assure you that in Christ Jesus, we are perfect before the Father. Amen. How do I know that? Because when you've been forgiven, you cannot be any more forgiven than you are. And when he writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, he doesn't do it so he can erase it. He does it so that it would stay there and you would relish in the truth that you are loved more than you could ever dare to hope. He wants you to know the truth that it is. You may not be perfect, but you're perfect in Him. Amen. You may have a lot of growing to do, and I'm sure you do like me. And there's a continued work going on in my heart just like yours. And I would say to you that the path of discipleship begins with repentance. Let me close with this story. Anyone ever hear of Dickie Simpkins? Basketball player? He was a backup point guard for the Chicago Bulls. 11 years ago, okay, so it's been a little while. But notice this story. Vicki Simpkins, this backup, backup point guard, he had gotten a new jersey. And the jersey, instead of saying Simpkins, said Smithkins on the back of it. They put his name wrong on the back of his jersey. And he was kind of irritated about it all, but decided, well, he would play with it that night anyway. 
Well, he played that night and had the best game he ever had. In fact, that whole week, he was smoking the court. I mean, it was fantastic. And he got to thinking, I'm going to leave it this way because this is a, this is a, a, a good luck charm, maybe, you know? <laughs> After one week, Smithkins went back to, I'm sorry, <laughs> he went back to being the old player he used to be. <laughs> and that's the challenge. Brothers and sisters, we may fail, we may struggle, we may have great successes, but we don't get out of the game. <laughs> we stay in. We stay committed to Jesus, what he's called us to do, how he's called us to, to shape us. One of the most exciting experiences that we read about in the Gospels is when Jesus told his disciples to go out and do missionary work. You can read about it in Luke 10 and elsewhere. When the disciples came back, they were so overjoyed. Do you remember what they said? They said that even the, the, the demons obey us. Remember Jesus' first words? He said, do not rejoice in that. You know, that, that, as far as God's view is concerned, dealing with demons is child's play. He can say the word, it's done. See, that's nothing. Okay? He said, don't rejoice in that. He said, rejoice in this. That your names are written in the life. Amen. That your names are written there. Now notice what he said last. This is the best part. He said to those disciples. Watch this. What, what Luke writes. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. This is one of the few places we see in Scripture where the joy of Jesus is revealed in his word. He was what was he so happy about? Because some of his disciples they were getting. And they were going. And they were coming back to celebrate. And tell them what God is doing. Yes. A church is not measured so much by its building, but by its sending. Amen. May God give us courage to be a part of that mission. Amen. Amen.